Hello, everybody. My name is Neil, Neil Otten. Uh, this is research that I've done with my advisors, Greg Ristig and Aram Galstian. We're from the University of Southern California. This group of talks is about inference and graphical models, so here's a graphical model for you. Uh, here's some latent variables y, some observed variables x, and we're dealing with inference in graphical models. So we're given the model, we're just doing the E's part of an, the EM algorithm. Uh, there's many ways to think about inference. One, the most popular, you've already seen it, variational inference. Great, you guys already know about the elbow. This is the uh, variational lower bound on uh, log likelihood. You guys may also know about the explaining away effect. It's what makes inference in graphical models difficult. It says that the latent variables start out independent, but conditioned on the observation, they are no longer conditionally independent. Uh, and so you can see from the elbow, all the yj's, you can't see my cursor, but uh, we usually we have to optimize this elbow with something like coordinate ascent, which is like, if you don't know what that is, it's like gauss seal from linear algebra, hold all the latent variables constant except for one, update that one and iterate over them. That's called coordinate ascent variational inference. Uh, we don't always have to deal with the explaining wave effect. Here's an example of a very simple model. I call it a forest model because the graphical structure is a forest. You have one tree per latent variable. And this uh, model is very nice because the, because the latent variables are conditionally independent given the observation. Uh, you can see how this helps us to do variational inference. The conditional distribution has a special form. If you look at the first line, EIJ is an indicator indicating which latent variable YJ is the parent of the uh, observed variable XI. And when you use this special form and you plug it into the elbow, you get something that looks very nice. It, you get an objective which separates as a sum of terms, each of which involves only a single latent variable, yj. So we get to do this very nice trick. We switch the maximum with the sum, and all of a sudden we can do inference in parallel. Sound familiar? That's the name of the uh, presentation, parallel inference. Uh, so. If you're hungry thinking about lunch, this is the time to start paying attention. This is a frustrating model. This is a graphical model which is almost forest-like. I have a forest of strong dependencies, those are the black arrows, but I also have these bunch of weak dependencies which ruins the nice graphical structure of the model. And so what am I to do? I can't switch the maximum with the sum anymore, so I can't do parallel inference, but so do I have to resort, the question is do I have to resort to the slow serial coordinate ascent algorithm? It's really frustrating to have to do coordinate ascent for models like these because we expect the inference in nearly, what does it say? Inference in nearly forest like model, in nearly forest models should be nearly as fast as in forest models. Here's our cartoon, here's a cartoon explaining what I mean. For forest models, we get to do inference in one parallel step, super fast. As soon as we step away from a, fer from a forest model into these nearly uh, forest models, we have to resort to coordinate ascent, meaning you have to iterate over all the latent variables one at a time. So all, m is the number of latent variables. So all of a sudden, the time to do inference uh, jumps really quickly. This is really frustrating. What we like to do have is a, a curve like this, where as soon as I step off the, uh, as soon as I'm no longer force model, I can still do inference almost as fast as if I was doing a force model. And so that's what we're going to do. Uh, our goal is going to be, do I have a slide for this? Yes. Our strategy is to lower bound the elbow, the variational bound, by a new objective, which does separate as a sum of terms, each of which involves only a single latent variable. That way we can use the trick that you saw in the forest model, switch the maximum with the sum, then we can do parallel inference. Most people try to find tighter bounds on log likelihood. Here we're going to find a looser bound on log likelihood compared to the elbow. Uh, and we're also going to do some dirty, filthy algebra, so focus, uh, Stay with me, but I'll be with you every step of the way. First, we're going to make some assumptions. We're going to get some tools uh, that are rather general. First, we're doing mean field variational inference. This is going to help. Uh, second is we're going to deal with deep exponential family models. In particular, we're only deal in this example, we only have one layer of latent variables, so it's rather shallow. But really what it means is that the conditional distribution belongs in an exponential family. And then lastly, we have the natural parameters are an affine function of the latent variables. This can be loosened a little bit, but not much. We won't talk about that today. All right, we're ready to do some algebra. Race yourselves. We're, here's the elbow. And we're trying to lower bound the elbow by an objective which separates the sum of terms, each of which involves only a single yj. Uh, let's look at the KL divergence term. It's already exactly how we want it. It separates us the sum of terms, each of which involves only a single latent variable. All the problem is in these conditional likelihoods. Luckily, we made some assumptions that simplify this form. So let's put those together. There's your assumptions, so put them together. The conditional likelihood takes on this form. Now let's 
Brace yourselves, look at this algebra. I know it's a lot, it's dense, but let's look at this term in blue. This is a constant, this is not scary. Uh, this is not keeping us from doing parallel inference. This term is already a sum of terms, each of which involves only a single latent variable. It's exactly how I want it. Great, so this term isn't scary either. It's the big bad log partition function, the infamous log partition function, uh, which is keeping all the yj's tied together. What do we know about the log partition function exponential family? So there's lots of nice properties. The one that we're going to use is that it's always a convex function. You may remember this from exponential family. Second derivative is variance, it's positive, uh, so it's a convex function. So what is a grad student to do? I'm thinking, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm trying to find a lower bound. What's the lower bound for convex functions? Jensen's inequality. Great, OK. But Jensen's inequality says something about there, you pull an expectation from the inside of the convex function out if I want a lower bound. Uh, but I don't see an expectation on the inside. So what am I going to do? I'm just going to put one there. So let's consider a set of uh, numbers, like a distribution, not negative, add up to one. This is, a, I'll call that vector epsilon i. Uh, and I'm just going to put them in there. Look at the first line. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of algebra. There's epsilon ij's. I just multiply and divide by epsilon ij. Looking good so far. Jensen's inequality doesn't say anything about a plus b i on the outside, so I've got to bring that inside the sum. How do I do that? Well, I'll use that nice little blue equality and say let's just split up b i according to epsilon. That brings me inside the sum. Now I'm ready to use Jensen's inequality. That's the inequality in the last line. That's Jensen's inequality. Great. This is exactly what I wanted. I've Set, I've lower bounded the log partition function by, by something that separates into a sum of terms. Uh, it turns out this bound is actually quite loose the way I've written it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make it a little bit tighter. Instead of just splitting up bi according to epsilon i, I'm going to introduce some more auxiliary parameters. Don't worry about them right now. Just trust me, you need to do this. But uh, once you do that, we're now ready to wrap up our uh, lower bound. We're almost at the end. Stay with me here. This is a lot of algebra. We're going to do some simplification. These terms are really interesting. They have a nice interpretation. I can interpret them as the natural parameters for a new set of distributions, some new expert distributions. Uh, when I introduce this new notation, I can find these uh, expert distributions p hat with natural parameters eta hat. And when I rewrite the uh, lower bound using uh, this notation, I get something that looks really nice. I get the log conditionals lower bounded by this weighted average of the log likelihoods of the expert distributions. This is no coincidence. There's a lot of interesting information geometry going on here, but I won't talk about that. What I'm just going to do is I'm going to plug it into the elbow. So here's your, lower, your final lower bound on log likelihood. This is the forest mixture bound. Notice we introduced those auxiliary parameters, epsilon and b hat. So we have to optimize over not just the variational distribution now, but also the auxiliary parameters. But uh, this is what the paper is about. This is no more algebra that you have to pay attention to. But uh, the rest of the presentation is about analyzing this new mathematical object. We're going to optimize it with an algorithm. We're going to, oh, here's the slides. We're going to optimize it. How do I optimize it? I'm going to show you how. How quickly does it uh, converge? And also, I'm going to talk a little bit about the tightness of the bound, and then I'll have experiments. Um, all of the analysis for these three things is super easy in the case when the latent and the observed variables are Gaussian. If you want to do non-Gaussian models, you're going to still have to use this math. Come talk to me later. But uh, yeah, let's go on to optimization. So how do I optimize this? It's exactly how I said before. I'm going to do it in parallel. I'm going to do, use the trick where I switch the maximum and the sum so I can optimize over the variational distribution in parallel because the objective is a sum over j. Uh, it's also a sum over i, so I can optimize over the auxiliary parameters in parallel. Great, everything's parallel. This is an alternating maximization algorithm. Very common. Uh, so first I want to talk about the optimal choice of the auxiliary parameters. This looks really complicated. I'll walk you through it. The really nice thing about, interesting thing about the uh, optimal choice for the auxiliary parameters is that they normalize the mean and the variance of those special expert natural parameters that I defined earlier. Super interesting. Coincidence? Maybe. I don't know. But uh, the other interesting thing about these, uh, uh, the optimal update is if you look at the update for the epsilon ij, it's basically proportional to the absolute value of wij, which measures the dependence of the observed variable xi on the parent yj. Uh, you can basically interpret these epsilon i's as a distribution over parents, where I give higher, uh, there's more probability masses on the parents that have higher dependence on the uh, observed variable. Those are the auxiliary parameter updates, and I want to talk about the updates to the variational distribution. This is the thing that we're doing in parallel that we really wanted to do in parallel. 
first uh, to show, I'm going to show you the updates for in the coordinate descent algorithm, with the one where you do for one latent variable at a time. And so let's look at the object. Uh, what is the update? Break it down. It has a very uh, nice interpretation. Thank you for the audio. Uh, the first term is the the first term, the x minus expectation of eta. That's the residual. The dot product, that's a correlation between the residual and the weight vector, it makes sense. So we're trying, we're going to move the mean towards the correlation. But then there's also this damping factor that tries to keep you close to where the expectation was in the previous iteration. All right, now watch closely. What does the update look like for updating the force mixture bound? It's this. The epsilon ij's just appear in the denominator. So the damp, the only thing that's changed is the damping term. Since the, since the epsilon ij's are smaller than one, this means the damping factor is bigger. Makes sense. So we're going to be making small steps at each iteration. That's what this says. So for dense models where epsilon ij is kind of spread out evenly, uh, the damping factor is going to be a lot bigger. So we're going to make small steps. Uh, we're going to change the mean of the variational distribution a little bit at a time. And we're look at the variance term. The damping term also appears in the uh, variance term. We're going to keep the variance small. So that's basically. Uh, that's what you need to know about the algorithm. Uh, so nice other uh, characteristics of the algorithm is you saw how similar it was to the coordinate ascent uh, uh, update. If epsilon ij is 1, then you're exactly doing a coordinate ascent update. If you just fix epsilon ij to all be 1 for this latent variable, that means you're going to do a coordinate st ascent step for that latent variable. So you can also interpret epsilon i as indicating which variable to update next, kind of. Uh, the other nice thing is that epsilon ij is 1 for wherever the weights are non-zero, in particular for a force model. So uh, for an exact force model, we will uh, the for this algorithm recreates the parallel force algorithm that I talked about earlier. Uh, so that's the algorithm. Before we go on to experiments, uh, I want to talk about the tightness of the bound. So in the Gaussian case, again, we can do algebra very nicely. We can come up with this expression for the difference between the elbow and the bound that we derived for a fixed variational distribution, right? So we're basically measuring how big was that gap that we made when we did Jensen's inequality. And it's this, it's this expression. Super interesting. I love the one norm squared. It's a super interesting quantity. Uh, but the gap is exactly the difference between the one norm squared and the two norm squared. When is the bound tight? Again, it's tight, very nice. It's tight in the case of a force model, in which case both the one norm and the two norm are equal. It's also tight in the case when the variance of the variational distribution is zero. This isn't super interesting for continuous probability because then the bound will be negative infinity for both. Remember, uh, according, to continue, according to continuous probability, the entropy of a distribution with zero variance is negative infinity. Uh, but it's useful for discrete, if you're talking about discrete models, because then the entropy of a distribution with zero variance is zero. And so we can get it, set up this nice uh, chain of inequalities which is uh, the FM bound, the bound that we derived, is right in between the variational bound and the uh, map objective. Uh, OK, now we're going to talk about experiments. First one that we're going to uh, try to verify is that the algorithm is faster for more forest-like models. We saw the damping factor was exactly you were do, reproducing the forest algorithm for forest models. We expect that. Uh, Inference will be faster and more forest-like models. So we're going to set, we're going to make a synthetic model and do inference in that model. Uh, it's basically a convnet with a single kernel. We're going to change the width of the kernel. So for larger, uh, well, for wider kernels, it's more dense. I'll show you a picture in the next slide. Uh, and then also we need a way to compare these different methods, optimizing the uh, elbow versus the force mixture bound. I would, you would think that the best way to do it would or the best comparison would be according to how tight is the bound on log likelihood, but by construction, the force mixture bound is less than the force, less than the elbow. Uh, and it's because it gets the variance term wrong. If you saw it, the variance stays super small throughout uh, inference. And so what we, instead the way we'll compare them is how uh, right do you get the mean, which is uh, what the map objective tells you, which is in the Gaussian case, this is basically ridge regression. Uh, so let me talk about, explain more about the model that we're using. It's a convnet. So th this would be the example where the uh, kernel was 3 by 3. Here's an example of a latent variable. There's an example of a latent variable. Uh, and also we include all uh, windows that have at least one pixel overlap with the uh, observation. 
I forgot to say, the observation that we're using is MNIST. So this is, a, this is an image, these are the pixels, we're basically doing a comp net. And so this is a result when the observation is an MNIST digit, and you can see how quick uh, the inference algorithm converges depending on how wide the uh, kernel is. For a very small kernel, that's more force-like, it converges very quickly. For larger kernels, it converges more slowly. Notice the y-axis is in uh, log scale. Uh, we also did some real data. People love real data. So we did CIFAR, and instead of using a kernel where all the weights were one, we used 20 trained kernels from an AlexNet type neural net. And again, what you see is con it converges super quickly for when this uh, kernel width is small, and it converges more slowly for wider kernels. Uh, the second experiment that we did is we actually want to see how uh, whether or not this is uh, converges faster than the coordinate descent algorithm, that was the main goal, right? Uh, so we can we compare it to coordinate descent. We also compare it to block coordinate descent, which is what you use for. Well, let me just show you the picture. The picture when we have blocks of latent variables that are conditionally independent. So if I look at these three variables, if I do that same convolution over this. Uh, Block of, uh, block of pixels and I do the same thing over here, well then now these two blocks of latent variables are conditionally independent. So I can update one latent variable from the block on the left hand side and from the right hand side in parallel. If I have 16 blocks, well now according to this special graphical structure, I can update 16 latent variables in parallel, so it should be 16 times as fast as coordinate ascent. And so the question is for even a model like this, which has super special structure, can it even be, uh, can the force mixture bound beat even this super uh, nice block coordinates and algorithm? And the idea is you should probably be able to, to do that because within blocks, you'll still have latent variables that are conditionally independent, but that aren't being updated in parallel. And so this is the result. Uh, so coordinate ascent, super slow. Block coordinate ascent, much faster than coordinate ascent, but still much slower than force mixture algorithm. Uh, that's my last slide. Here's the conclusion. This is me again. Look up the paper. Super interesting. Force mixture bound. Uh, also, slides are online. But that's all. Thank you. <laughs>